Our next comedian is named Merle Kessler. He is also known as Ian Scholes. That's his nom de radio. He's one of the founders of the legendary Duck's Breath Mystery Theater. He is also an author and performer. As Ian Scholes, Merle Kessler has been heard on NPR's Morning Edition, seen on ABC's World News Now, and read in the New York Times, Salon.com, and elsewhere. He currently provides commentary for Philosophy Talk, which airs Sundays at 10 a.m. on KALW. His latest performance piece, Slouching Towards Disneyland, opened at the Marsh Theater in San Francisco last November. Please welcome Merle Kessler. Oh, is this, this is on? All right, uh, yeah, so I'm not really a comedian, I'm a humorist, which is a comedian without memorization skills. Uh, this is gonna be sort of the downside of science, just because I figured, you know, you know, why not? Uh, I'm not a church-going man, and to those who don't believe in evolution, I always counter, did the Garden of Eden contain Monsanto insecticide-resistant canola, and rest my case. Though I wouldn't mind going to one of those Christian-themed amusement parks in which Neanderthals and dinosaurs roam freely in a science-free wonderland, I mean, where's the harm? And I am fascinated by arguments for the existence of God, which I find inventive, if not convincing, being an insistently disbelieving kind of guy. Certainty fascinates me. Many beliefs puzzle me, however. How can you be a Satanist, for instance? I mean, if you believe that Satan exists, does that not presuppose that God also exists? You're kind of backing the wrong horse, aren't you? <laughs> and atheism puzzles me. How can people be so certain about something that can't be proved one way or another? In other words, doesn't atheism require its own kind of faith? And if so, what's the point? And even if you are an atheist, how can you be evangelical about it? The message is, there's no message. <laughs> well, thank you. Can I go home now? Uh, several stridently atheist books have been published over the past few years. Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. Christopher Hickens, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And of course, there is Religious, uh, the new Bill Maher movie. Uh, you know, a jerk from HBO doesn't believe in God. Well, okay, whatever. Okay, Sitchin said once in an interview, all religious belief is sinister and infantile. Well, Tell that to Spinoza, pal. Uh, back in 2002, there was an event called the Godless Americans March on Washington. It was not preceded by a prayer breakfast. <laughs> Around 2,000 people attended. One of the attendees, Paul Geiser, decided he didn't like the term godless or the atheist or atheist and teamed up in 2003 with a woman named Minga Futrell to form a new organization called The Brights. Its members espouse a naturalist rather than supernaturalist worldview. The Brights include Richard Dawkins, Steven Pinker, philosopher Daniel Dennett, James the Amazing Randy, Pendulette, and Teller. Daniel Dennett wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times in which he said, quote, don't confuse the noun with the adjective. I'm a bright is not a boast, but a proud avowal of an inquisitive worldview, unquote. Well, Dennett may think he's not boasting, but that seems like magical thinking to me. If some guy or gal came up to you and declared, I'm a bright, I can guarantee you will have one of three responses. One, think, uh-oh, a cult member, and back away slowly with a fixed smile on your face. Two, think resentfully, if you're a bright, what am I? Or three, say, I'm a bright too. Show each other your lapel pins and perform the secret atheist handshake as the rest of the party backs away from you slowly with fixed smiles on their faces. <laughs> Many atheists have not signed up, mainly because of the name, the Brights. Christopher Hitchens called the name cringe-making. The skeptical, skeptical inquirer opined that it is not the philosophy of the movement under debate, but the brand name. The inquirer suggested that the founders do focus group testing for a better name. Well, I don't know, faith in focus groups seems like more magical thinking to me, but my big quibble is this. Why on earth would atheists want to get together in the first place? After the initial exchange, I don't believe in God. Me neither. Well, then what? Atheists should form a knitting club instead, at least to get a sweater out of the deal. <laughs> so, okay, let's move on to dualism. If you believe that mind and matter are two separate deals, you're a dualist. Dualism has been around a long time, and dualist skeptics have been around a long time, too. You might say, we're of two minds about dualism. Uh, some of us want to believe that there's a soul in there somewhere, but the best evidence right now seems to suggest, uh, sorry folks, it's just neurons firing. Dualism began to be called into question with the rise of the scientific revolution. Psychology came along with the implication that the brain itself is a machine that can be understood by its parts. And of course, modern genetics and brain research further the notion that, as Daniel Dennett put it, quote, we're all zombies, nobody is conscious, unquote. He also wrote, quote, dualism has been relegated to the trash heap of history along with alchemy and astrology, unquote. But strangely enough, one of the means by which proponents seek to prove dualism is exactly through astrology and alchemy, well, through parapsychology anyway. The idea is that if telekinesis can be proven, if out-of-body experiences can be proven, it would also be proof there are forces outside the realm of physics. And if telepathy could be proven, well, if you can read a mind, doesn't that mean there's a mind to read? 
Uh, this may be one of the reasons why skeptics are so eager to debunk the paranormal. A Filipino faith healer can't remove a glop of pathological matter from a patient for two seconds without the amazing Randy popping up to debunk him. Skeptics are constantly writing articles proving that astrology has no foundation in science. And what's the point of that? Nobody believes in astrology. It's just something to read to kill time in the subway if you don't have a pen for the crossword. And skeptics are always making flying saucers out of pie tins to prove that flying saucers are fake. Again, point. You might say that the supernatural is a threat to the materialist's own atheistic robot-driven worldview that we are nothing more than puppets dancing on the strings of physiology. Well, I don't know. If you claim that moving objects in your mind is outside the realm of physics, well, outside the realm of physics now, today's paranormal could be tomorrow's normal. We already know that observation has no effect on the observed. If a tree falls in a forest, nobody's there to hear it. In fact, it does not make a sound. And if you bend a spoon with your mind, how can you be sure you're really bending the spoon with your mind? Maybe the spoon decided to bend on its own. <laughs> Even if parapsychological phenomena come to be accepted as actual physical phenomena, wouldn't that paradoxically be a mechanistic proof of dualism? And therefore, no proof at all. If there's concrete proof of an afterlife, what's the use of faith? And even if it is proof of a dualistic universe, well, who wants to live in a dualistic universe where all the spoons are bent and useless? <laughs> we can all convert to sporks, I suppose, and we can thank science for the spork. Along with the iPod, which I don't get, I really don't want an entertainment system I can accidentally swallow. The light bulb, the Higgs boson, and Monsanto insecticide-resistant canola, a fully patented natural wonder. What Monsanto did was modify canola gene to make it resistant to a Monsanto weed killer, which is kind of like having your cake and eating it too. <laughs> Monsanto was a rule, when you buy Roundup-ready canola, you agree to buy new seed every year to pay for future research to make better plants. For seven years, Canadian farmer Percy Schmeisser didn't pay. He claimed the seeds had landed on his farm by accident and he didn't know they were Monsanto. Some say he should have known when they didn't die after he sprayed them with the weed killer. Anyway, Monsanto sued him for stealing seeds. He argued back, according to the CBC, that a company can't patent a plant. The case went to Canada's highest court, which, quote, did agree with Schweitzer that the plant is a higher life form and cannot be patented, but said the patent does apply to the gene, unquote. On the other hand, Schweitzer didn't have to pay a fine, so... There is that. And what has happened since, on its website, Center for Cooperative Research, informed me, quote, one, uh, quote, uh, quote, informed me once again, quote, Percy Schmeisser finds volunteer Roundup Ready canola plants growing in a 50-acre parcel of his farm. He calls Monsanto and asks them to remove the plants. A team of Monsanto investigators shows up and offers to remove the plants. But before they do, they ask him to sign a legal release. Schmeisser refuses. With neither side willing to give in to the other's demand, Schmeisser removes, his, removes the plants himself. A Monsanto spokesperson insists the company is under no legal obligation to remove plants that show up in fields uninvited, unquote. So there you go, I guess. Monsanto forbids him to grow it. The farmer says he didn't even want to grow it, and the canola shows up anyway. Some skirmishes in the bioethics war. Leave the gun, take the canola. And what about clones, you ask? Well, don't sweat the clones, my friends. What are they going to do? Look like you to death? So it's not ignorant anti-evolution ID wackos. The real threat is lawyers and secular humanists trying to make a buck. And what do secular humanists believe in? The agnostic, agnostic equivalent of the rapture, the singularity. The point at which artificial intelligence becomes greater than human, which in turn will lead to Arnold Schwarzenegger going back in time to kill Sarah Connor, <laughs> and Keanu Reeves choosing the red pill. Now back in the late 80s, Hans Moravec, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University's Robotics Institute, wrote a book called Mind Children. The Future of Robot and Human Intelligence. In it, he posited that around 2030, robots will achieve human equivalence. Rather than being alarmed by this, Moravec was enthusiastic. He posited humans will then become robots themselves through the loving aid of robot surgeons. He wrote, quote, layer after layer, the brain is simulated, then excavated. Your, <laughs> your suddenly abandoned body goes into spasms and dies. Your perspective has shifted to a shiny new body of the style, color, and material of your choice, unquote. Uh, Mind Children earned Moravec a certain amount of fame in geek world. In an interview with Wired in 1995, he claimed the robots will take good care of humans, whom he cheerfully called Earth's small-minded biological natives. He told the interviewer, quote, they will in fact be able to recreate a model of our entire civilization with everything and everyone in it, down to the atomic level, simulating our atoms with machinery that's vastly subatomic. Also, they will use data compression to remove the redundant stuff that isn't important, unquote. So humans will become semi-robot inhabitants in a robot simulation of human history, kind of like Disneyland without the parking lots. <laughs> Finally, speaking of Disneyland economics, the dismal science was actually, until the recent financial unpleasantness, pretty sassy. 
It was all infomercials and large print bestsellers and reassuring, reassuring us with a toothy grin that whatever our decisions were, buying short, long, or just hugging our cards to our chest, we were guaranteed a profit. Our self-confident and ever-wise free marketplace expanded beyond mere goods and services into a wondrous new arena where you did not have to actually buy anything, but instead could decide to place complicated wagers on whether a particular good or service would go up or down in value. This led to a number of strange financial instruments. Collateralized mortgage obligations, layered options, structured investment vehicles, derivatives, tranches. Instrumental in the creation of these instruments was a new field, behavioral finance, which attempted to make any perceived irrationality in the marketplace subject to computer models, chaos theory, and complicated algorithms. The highly paid big brains that came up with this stuff are known as quantitative analysts or quants. I recently came across a 1994 feature in Wired magazine by Kevin Kelly about a quant, one Doan Farmer, this being in Wired, in which computers always and forever exist to make our lives better. It was a highly uncritical story, which called Farmer a guru, high-tech legend, and a principal character in a renegade band of scientists. Farmer's business was called the Prediction Company. He likened his economic work to predicting where a balloon was going to land if he sent it bouncing around a room. You couldn't say exactly, but you could come pretty close. Eerily, in light of recent events, what Mr. Farmer dabbled in back in 94 was derivatives. The author explained it this way, quote, a derivative is sort of a bet on a bet, or a speculation squared. Third and fourth order derivatives, those betting in an option based on a bet that hinges on another gamble, up the complexity and incomprehensibility of these financial instruments, unquote. Well, exactly. All these financial instruments went belly up because they owned all these derivatives and didn't even know what was in them. In other words, to go back to Mr. Farmer's metaphor, when you release the balloon that is the economy, it might be a balloon, it might be slices of a balloon, it might be somebody's bet on what a balloon will look like in 2012, or it may turn into a soccer ball, or suddenly explode, like the Hindenburg. Anyway, it wasn't a balloon, it was an enormous Ponzi scheme. Usually in a Ponzi scheme, it's the suckers who lose their shirts. In this case, the big brain Ponzi's themselves believed in it, and became the biggest suckers of all when the whole thing went down like a lead balloon. The prediction company, by the way, signed an exclusive contract in the 90s with derivatives trading house O'Connor & Associates, which merged with Swiss Bank Corporation, which merged with Union Bank of Switzerland, which lost $12 billion in the first quarter of 2008. Because of the subprime mortgage crisis, the lead balloon that sank all boats. Thank you, science. I gotta go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>